was tempted to ask Daniel, would you stand up and read it for us in Greek, Daniel? But, which he could, I know he could. In his Greek New Testament. Let's turn into chapter 14. I'm going to read from verses 1 down to verse 14. Follow along in your Bibles with me, please, as we read the Word of God. Now, it happened that he, that is Jesus, went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath, that they watched him closely. And behold, there was a certain man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus answering spoke to the lawyers and the Pharisees saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? But they kept silent. And he took him and healed him and let him go. Then he answered them saying, Which of you having a donkey or an ox that has fallen into a pit will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? But they could not answer him regarding these things. So he told a parable to those who were invited when he noted how they chose the best places, saying to them, When you're invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down at the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. And he who invited you and him come to you and say to you, Give place to this man. And then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place so that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, go up higher. Then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled And he who humbles himself will be exalted. Then he also said to him who had invited him, When you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. But when you have a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. And you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Amen. Amen. Last week we looked at the first part of this chapter from verses 1 down to verse 6 about the man with dropsy. Jesus had been invited to the house like an after church supper or dinner meal, as was the custom. And he would, was invited by one of the leaders of the Pharisees. So this wasn't just an ordinary person. This would be like him being invited to the house of a major politician or a, ba- no, I was going to say a Baptist, no, I'm a Baptist, a bishop, somebody important. Indeed, being a ruler of the Pharisees, he most likely was one of the 70, the Sanhedrin, the rulers of the country. So this was a kind of a big deal says here in the, in the text that, that they invited him that they might watch him closely. And indeed, we see by the context of the, the, the story that it was a setup. A man with the condition of dropsy. Dropsy itself isn't, a, isn't an illness, but it is the symptom of an illness. Either brain, lungs, liver, or kidneys, I believe Don's wife told me, who is a doctor. Yeah, oh dear. So I, I have to get, I have to get my, my facts right then. And what it is, is the swelling of fluid in the joints and in, in, in the body. And this man was set before Jesus, the, the, it said here. And Jesus, understanding the situation, he answers them. And of course, he, he takes them. And I love that word. It's, in our Bible, it's very respectableized. That's not a word, but we, we will make it up respectableized it says he takes the man but in the greek it literally means he grabs him seizes him with passion goes and gets him he doesn't say could you come here please no just gently bringing him over 
He goes and gets the man. And there is a, 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 an action there. You know, all too often we see Jesus as a passive kind of guy. You know, this, this picture of this beautiful hair model, you know, with a perfect beard, who is all Zen master and just walks around quiet and nice, you know, is a very shy kind of boy. But we don't see that in the text here. We see a man of action and of passion. And the Bible says he goes and takes the man, heals them, and then sends them out. The man didn't ask to get healed. I love that. He's like, oh. There was no prayer being prayed. Just heals them and then dismisses them, sends them out. You are dismissed. Go away. And Christ then, of course, turns his attention to the Pharisees and rebukes them for their hard-heartedness because of their religiosity. They are trying to trip him up and trap him, trying to prove that he is not really a godly man because he is working on the Sabbath. The condition of dropsy, though is serious, is not life-threatening. Well, not absolute at that point. You're not going to die. If, oh, gosh, I've got a little bit of swelling. I'm going to die right here now. And so it was the thought of the Pharisees that unless it was a medical emergency, you shouldn't heal anybody. You shouldn't be active. He's not in danger. Why are you healing him today? Can you not wait until, I guess we would say, the Sunday to do it? There are six other days to heal. Why don't you do it in that day? That was their mentality. And yet Jesus shows them very clearly that if someone has a need and something is required, should we not then do it? The Sabbath was not provided to bind a man, to be a burden to him, but rather a place of blessing. And here Jesus, of course, he asks, of course, the first of all, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? The idea of lawful is, is it forbidden in the law of God? Not in the Talmud or the Shabbat or any of the other Jewish commentaries on the law, the traditions of the Jews. But in the law of God, is it forbidden? And they knew it wasn't, so they didn't say anything. Otherwise, they would have put themselves in a difficult... If they had said yes, they would have shown themselves to be liars. If they had said no, well then Jesus could have healed and they couldn't have condemned them about anything. So they were in a difficult situation. So they said nothing and sat there in stubborn silence. Eating their olives and drinking their wine. Jesus heals them, sends them out. And rebukes them. And then he turns his attention in verse 7. To the one who invited him. To this little meal. It says he told a parable to those who were invited. And he noted. how they, Sorry, wrong way around. He, he turns his attention to the guests first of all. Not to the, to the, the host. And he says, they noticed how they chose the best places. The idea here isn't that they, they chose the, no, the most convenient place, but the places of honor. And it wasn't that, that one person, they jostled over it. They wrestled. There was this embarrassing tussle to be in the, in the best place. Now, to understand this, you need to understand first century dining etiquette. It, it was very popular in the time of Christ to have what's called a, a, a trilinium table. A trilinium table was a, a, a table set like a U. You understand what I mean? Like a horseshoe type table. Three here and three there. Or five here and three there. And you didn't sit at the table like we do today. Us barbarians. You know, we don't know how to eat. But in Christ's day, you would have lay on a couch, like a little bed at the side of the table. And it wasn't a one-person couch or bed. It was a three-person couch or a five-person at the head of the table. And so you would have lay with your head at the top at the table and your feet by the wall. So you're lying down on your side or on your tummy. There's a little 
pillow here and the table is set in front of you. So you can pick and the servants can come up the inside of the horseshoe or the inside of the U and they can serve you. And so you're all, and everyone is facing one another and, and everyone is facing the top of the table. So the most important place at the table, if you can think of, of a shape of a U, is of course right in the heart, number one. This person sitting here is the most important person of the meal. The least important person would be the person, I think it was on the left hand side at the very end of the table. The other more important, so you have the first place of importance and then the second place of importance would be if you can imagine the three people lying here, you have the person on the outside, the person on the inside, and then the person closest to the top. The people in the middle were always the important people. The people on the outsides were the last. It, it, it was very strict and rigid in its protocol. And of course the host, the one hosting the dinner, he normally took the least place of importance right down there at the end of the table on the left-hand side. And so when Jesus is at this meal, he notices all of these Pharisees or important people, rich people, whoever they were, jostling for the best places at the table to be either near the, the, the ruler of the Pharisees or just there's this kind of pushing people off, you know, and I'm more important. I deserve this place. There is a great sense of ambition and battle in the text where these people were fighting over who should sit where. And Jesus, in responding to this, tells this little story. Now, it's a parable. We're often more familiar with Jesus' Arable parables, arable parables, that's hard to say. The, the ones about the farms or the countryside. Here he's just giving instruction more or less about a table etiquette. And he says to do something that is so against the nature of man that it's almost laughable. It's almost a joke. It's almost like, are you being serious? What are you, what are you talking about? No. He says, when you're invited to anyone's to a wedding feast, do not go sit down at the best place. The idea there is to go sit at the groom. The, you know, the, the man who's being married, well, you go sit in his chair. Uh, how ridiculous is that? But here Jesus is saying that the, these men were behaving so foolishly that they were almost doing that. They were trying to find the best place so that everyone could see them and so everyone could recognize them. So everyone could acknowledge that they were worthy or worth it. Jesus warns them, well, you don't sit there because if you sit there, of course, the groom is going to come and then you're going to have to move and you're going to be embarrassed before everyone else. We understand that story. Jesus then gives the advice that when they are invited, that they're to go and take the lowest place. Now remember, the lowest place was supposedly reserved for the one hosting the feast. So you go and sit in that place, and then, of course, the one who's hosting the feast said, no, 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 don't, don't sit there. No, 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 move up, move up. It's okay. It's like if you go for coffee with me and we struggle over who's going to pay the bill, I pay the bill, okay? Let that, let that be heard. Don and I have had arm wrestles about that many times. Who pays the bill? I pay the bill. Right? And it's that kind of thing. There's, uh, no, please move up. And so Jesus here is speaking to them about their sense of worth and their sense of, of pride and self. There is a warning here to the religious community about this sense of entitlement, of being, of deserving attention. Quite clearly, it's a lesson on humility. It's a lesson on putting others above yourself. 
it is the, the spirit of true religion to elevate others before yourself. This is a lesson that Christ teaches time and time and time again throughout all the scriptures. Indeed, Old Testament and New. And in the life of Christ, he's repeatedly saying this, doesn't he? Remember the, the, the lesson of the washing of the feet? He wasn't instituting a ritual there. He was demonstrating the spirit of Christianity, the spirit of Christ. That Christ, that God came down, lived as a man and died, lived like a servant and died on the cross like a, like a condemned man. There is a topsy-turvy, upside-down kind of wisdom here. Like, there's a bit of a practical wisdom as well, you know, that, well, you, if you move to a lower place beyond your station and then someone's going to say, move up, well, then, of course, you're going to be honored. But you don't do it in order that somebody might honor you. You're doing it because you have a sense of worth and you desire that others might receive glory or honor or you want to acknowledge and help others more than yourself and i think i think this is one of the most important lessons that the church needs to learn that we are to not seek our best we are not to desire the adoration and acknowledgement of all the people around us i've been in church life a few years now. I've been a believer 28 years. I know I don't look that old. You think, wow, Kyle, you must have been like a child when you became a believer. No, no, I was, I was pretty old. I just look young. And in my experience of church life, this is one of the difficulties that we run into time and time again when people have a, an over, overinflated sense of self. An inflamed sense of importance. Of an artificial expectation to be seen and to be heard. To be recognized. To be acknowledged. My opinion is worth hearing. If you've ever been part of a, a church... Uh, committee meeting, membership meeting, where there are attitudes and issues and voices and opinions, and all of a sudden people, someone says something and then somebody else reacts to it, and all of a sudden we, people inflate like frogs. Have you ever seen a frog that inflates? All of a sudden they're like this, like some sort of puffer fish. What are you saying? What are you saying? What are you saying? And all kinds of wickedness and evil and ridiculousness happens. Christianity is to be clothed in humility. We are not to walk around like the princes of this earth. We are not to expect that everyone should, should buy into scrape and to listen to what we, we have to say. Indeed, one of the, one of the uh, commentaries that I read on this this week actually s speculated that Christ may have been put at the lowest point of the table. They may have slighted him. They may have insulted him on purpose. They invited him to this meal. But instead of putting him in a, the most important place at the table... For a joke, they put him at the end. Let him know his rank. You know, we often forget who Jesus really was. You know, for us, he's, he's our Christ. He's our prophet, our king. He's our priest, our high priest. We love him and we worship him. And we look at him with hindsight. And we know what he looks like and how he's going to return in glory. But when he was walking on this earth, 
he wasn't all that spectacular. You know, we, we have this image of Christ the carpenter. You've heard, you know, we all know that Jesus apparently was a carpenter. But that's not really a good translation, modern translation of the word of what he did. He was a construction worker. He was one who would labor in the building of construction. So we're not talking about some guy making fancy violins or beautiful furniture. We're talking a construction worker. An ordinary down-to-earth guy who helped build houses, dig ditches, construct walls. He was a construction worker. Now, you think construction worker having afternoon tea with the bishops. You think construction worker having tea with the first minister. These guys, they've, they've studied under Gamel. They've some studied at the, the highest Jewish universities and have degrees in this and that and their master and whatever else. They have their big hats and their funny beards and their big tassels on the end of their clothes. They're professional religious people. They can have a, 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 a conversation about any subject from the, from the Torah, from the law of God, and they're so professional that after four hours, they still won't have come to the answer. Because, you know, if you're a professional academic, you don't come to an answer. You just simply ask more questions. And if you come to an answer, you're not being academic enough. But here's Jesus, and Jesus comes to an answer. Jesus says it as it is. He, he's just a normal guy. He's bringing people to God. And he, there was something offensive about him to them. So again, it has been speculated that, that Jesus was at the end of the table and that he was not being honored. or He was being slighted, insulted. But was he put out? Was, he, was Jesus insulted? Was he taken aback? No. He was not, because why? He was clothed in humility. He knew who he, he knows who he is. Knew there, knows now. King of kings and the Lord of lords. God incarnate. What silly religious men say or think did not affect him. There is a lesson for us of the church that if we are to be Christ-like in our nature and in the demonstration of our religion, we must be clothed in humility. Not this feed me mentality. You know, peel me a grape, Don. Don, peel me a grape. You know, go get me a coffee, Don. This expectation of being served, this expectation of being heard, this expectation of being seen, and of being respected. Jesus said it's worth being disrespected. Again, he tells a parable about this wedding, but in reality, he's talking about our general mindset, how we think, who we are as people. For these professional religious people, it was all too easy to become arrogant. It was all too easy to become inflated and inflamed in their sense of self. I am the big man here, and you'll do what I say. Far too many of the churches, in my own experience, have suffered from that. Led by a strong figure who, who desires that all people should serve them. Not a servant who seeks to shepherd the flock. Who lays down their life. Who gives their everything. Who's not afraid to be in the background. Who doesn't get offended by sitting in the the least important seat. Believer, examine your own conduct. 
Examine your own thinking, your history. Are you Christ-like in your expression of your Christianity? Do you have the resemblance of the Father upon you? Is the fragrance of Christ heavy on you? Have you ever been, like, I don't know, the airport or the train station, and some little lady walks past, you know, those little ladies with the purple hair, and the perfume that she has on, the flies are dropping, you know, she walks through the airport and the, the train station, and she just has this cloud of perfume. And even when she's past, you can kind of smell where she leaves like a scent trail. This heavy perfumed air. Indeed, I know a lady who wears so much perfume, it gives you a headache, you know? It's like, I know, when you get over 60, your, your scent glands start working. And she, but you know where she's been in a room because of the scent. Beloved, we should have the scent of Christ upon us so that when we leave a room, there is the remembrance still, not of how good you are, not of how humble you are because we can sometimes pull that humble coat on you know look how humble i am look how humble i am and we boast in our humility we should desire never to be seen never to be heard but that christ should always be seen that christ's words should always be heard it is the spirit of worldly religion to, to fight and to, to tussle, to tumble, to struggle, to wrestle, to be seen. Here am I, look at me. Indeed, it is the wisdom of this world that he who shouts the loudest gets the most attention. You ever been to Dagus? You ever been to, you know, uh, fur school or... or it's the kids who are the bad, and one does not want to say bad, okay? You don't want to say bad anymore. Loudest and most troubled children in the group. Not even allowed, if you're allowed to say troubled anymore. You know that one child that runs around like a little tornado, like a little hurricane and things? And immediately everyone knows that child's name. Everybody knows whose parents that child. You know, there's this... In the sports world... I, I, I practice jiu-jitsu. I haven't used that in my preaching in a long time. Don't know if it's time to bring it back in. And in the sports world, you have these celebrities who have made their careers because they boast and they strut. Think of how Huma, Muhammad Ali. You think of uh, Conor McGregor. These men who strut. And they give the impression that they're, they're the greatest gift God has ever given the planet. And the people of this world pay them attention. <gasps> oh, wow. He's amazing. He's wonderful. He's brilliant. Wow. There's a fellow that my son and I like, who's a, not a usual, only him and I. Uh, yeah, Gordon uh, is a wrestler. And uh, he, he, Gordon Ryan, and all this week, he's been posting on Instagram because of the ADCCs this week, the, the, the World Championship and, and, and grappling wrestling. How wonderful, how great he is, and how he's going to beat everybody, and, he's, and he probably will, but he's just telling everybody how and he wears this golden crown just to demonstrate to everybody how wonderful he is. And I thought to myself, wow, take the top place at the table, why don't you? Because in the world's understanding, that's how you get attention. And that's how you find your sense of worth. But beloved, it is not supposed to be so in the church of Christ. The mentality and the wisdom of this world is if you want to get noticed, you've got to make a lot of noise. You've got to be active got to do stuff, got to be loud and colorful, have fancy glasses, have a slogan and a saying. I should get like a little thing for my, my you no, know, flowers or something. Got to do something. 
God, have billboards with your face on it. You ever been in America and you drive through America and some of the churches there have huge billboards of men's faces, a man and his wife, you know, the man's woman like, with beautiful teeth and perfect hair and a gorgeous suit, and his wife is sitting behind, standing behind going, you know, that kind of, it makes me sick. I walk through and I was like, oh, dear Lord. There's this, this is come to our church and be like us. Glorious. Doesn't say that, but it gives that impression, you know? Glorious. This beautiful head of hair and stuff, you know? Ridiculous. That is the wisdom of the world says, look at me, look at me, here am I, here am I. And they are rewarded by the people of this world with five minute fame, a flash in the pan, a rocket in the sky. But beloved, it should not be so with the children of God. Should not be so with the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has commanded us to be clothed in humility, that we are to seek each other's good, that we are not to be those who set themselves up to be worshipped and to be adorned, to be acknowledged and be applauded. Amen. All too often this spirit, this worldly spirit, comes into the church. A sense of celebrityness, of specialness. Let's guard our hearts from it. Guard your heart from it. Well, I've been in the faith 28 years and I know what I'm talking about. Gotta listen to me. Oh, God help us from that kind of spirit. I've been to Bible college, you know. I've read the scripture. I had a man once tell me, I read the Bible once. I wasn't a believer. I read the Bible once and I knew what it says. I said, you read it once and you knew what it says? That's amazing. I've been reading it for years and I still struggle. And I, he was like, yes, I read it from cover to cover. And I said, did you read the introduction, the prefix, the, the everything, every word from cover to cover? Even the ISBN number at the back from cover to cover. You gotta, and I know what the Bible says. You can't trick me. Evangelist, that's what he said to me. Evangelist, like it was a bad word. And I said, really? What are the names of the books of the Bible? Huh? How many books are there in the Bible? Hey? Hey? What is the timeline of the Bible? Hey? What are the kings of Israel? Pre, during, and post exile. <laughs> what were the names of the apostles of Jesus Christ? That's an easy one. Come on. Sunday schools. Oh, I don't know. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Nah, Mark wasn't really an apostle. Nah. Hmm. Uh. Well, I've read Revelations. Well, first of all, it's Revelation. This is it right. And there can be this ridiculous idea just because we think we know something that we're entitled to something just because who we are and what we've done enables us to some sort of special treatment because I think I'm special so should you think I'm special indeed you think you think you're I'm more special than I think I'm more special understand it should not be so beloved let us clothe ourselves in humility let us Always seek to take the last place. Let us always deem our brothers and sisters in Christ more precious than us. Let us seek to be as Christ to them and serve them. Our Savior came not to be served. He came not to be wined and dined and chased after. Our Savior came to save sinners. Our Savior came as in the nature of a servant and gave himself for the church. And we, his people, who have been commanded to obey his commandments, we should seek to be like our Savior. We should go beyond just words, mouthing. Yeah, yeah, I know the Bible says that. Hmm. Mm -hmm. But let us do it. Let us be hearers of the word and doers of the word. Indeed, you demonstrate that you have heard it by the fact that you do it. 
Jesus then in verse 12 here, he turns then to the man who had, who hosted the feast, who had invited him. Remember, they're all lying down at the table, you know, they're, they're like lounging. And wherever this man was sitting, and the speculation was that the, the ruler of the Pharisees was sitting at the head of the table. He was the most important politically man there. He was at the top of the table. And everyone would have been turned to him to hear what he had to say and to see what he was doing and to <laughs> laugh at his jokes, you know. <laughs> Luis, that was so funny. <laughs> Christ turns to this man and he says this little story and it's like, I think it's like a knife into his heart. It's one of those scalpel sharp stories. You know, Jesus was so, oh, you know, with the, he could do things, say things that just left you wide open. You had no recovery from. This is the story. He says, when you give it, the advice, when you give a dinner or supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, or your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the, the lame, and the blind. And you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you, uh, such shall you be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Now Jesus wasn't saying that we shouldn't show hospitality to our family and friends, loved ones and neighbors in the street. But the idea here was this man was only asking the people who counted this man was only asking the people whom he knew would ask him back. That in his service to them, he was being self-served. You understand that there was this self-serving action in this feast. That in some way, in some way, he was benefiting from it. You know, you can imagine people leaving the feast and saying, he is such a good guy. I mean... He invited us, put on that beautiful meal, great host, lovely fella, great conversation, fantastic. We have to have them over at some time. And there's this, this building up of his reputation. He's doing it, these things, doing what is right with the wrong attitude. Again, a self-serving attitude. And Christ here is warning against false humility about the outward appearance, but the, the lack of inward reality. And if you want to be really seen to be a server, you want to be really seen to be one who is giving their life for others, well, help those who cannot help you. Help those who are of no benefit to you. Help those to whom society puts no worth upon. I mean, when Jesus says... The poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. In Pharisaic thinking, these are the cursed of God. You know, the, the Pharisees were health, wealth, prosperity kind of people. If God's blessing is upon your life, well then, you're going to, woo, you know, you're going to be rich and healthy and prosperous and powerful. God only loves those who can help themselves. Or the old saying, God only helps those who can help themselves. And they help themselves to everybody else's riches. When Jesus uses these people as an example, he's talking about, the, as Hillary Clinton said, Julia's not here, so I can say that. Hillary Clinton said, the deplorables, the basket of deplorables, the untouchables, the undesirables, the ones you don't want to touch because it's ooh, icky. And here Jesus is saying, show the reality of your profession. Not just in blah, 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 blah. Not just having us all getting together and, 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 you know, massaging each other's shoulders. Oh, yes, you're so good. Brushing each other's hair. You're so nice. Well done. Super well done. But there has to be a reality to your profession. There has to be a, a, a living out of your faith. Reality. Reality is hard. Reality is way hard. It's one of the reasons why the pub culture is so much more desirable than, than church culture. Because in pub culture, you can just fake it and pretend. And everyone's like, oh, you were so great. Yeah, you're so nice. And they're all pretending to like one another and love each other. And you have this kind of you know, 
intoxicated high that smooths everything out. You come to church, and you're faced with the truth, and you have to live in relationship with one another. When the reality of the scriptures, you know, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. And people are like, yeah, brother, amen, preach it. But you ever know how one iron sharpens another? Shing, shing. It cuts shavings off each other. It causes sparks and friction and tension. There is an abrasiveness between the two. Iron sharpening iron is not a, a good thing. It, it's it's or an easy thing. You come to church and you are challenged to be real. You have to live in community. You have to communicate. You have to love. You have to comfort. You have to, to be compassionate. There must be empathy there. And we all live under the shadow of the commands of Christ. It is not easy to live in community. Yet we are commanded to be real. Not just to be theatrical. Not just to put on a performance of being hospitable. Of being humble. I'm so humble. I'm so humble. You go first. No, you go first. No, you go first. Don, I'll pay the bill. No, Don. You, you, you know? I'll get this. No, you get this. No, maybe, but, but, but there must be a reality. And so the idea here is help those who have no benefit to you. Let the reality of your profession be seen in the fact that you do things that don't, doesn't benefit you. Indeed, you're losing out. You're not doing it for personal gain or for the, the, the benefit of your reputation because these people, as the Pharisees hung out with the blind, the lame, the maimed, they would be mocked. There would be the question mark, the exclamation mark. They'd be like, what's going on here? Do you remember what they used to say about Jesus? He associates with tax collectors and sinners. Whoa! And yet that is the, the standard to which Christ holds us to. Beloved, the spirit of the church should be clothed in humility. The spirit of your Christianity should be a humble and meek spirit one that sets others before itself one that happily takes the lesser seat and allows others to go before and be benefit one that doesn't grumble and spit when others are doing well you know we're all friends and happy until someone starts doing well and we're still in the little hole that we, we, we've been living in for forever. And their Lord is blessing them and they're benefiting. And you're thinking, well, I'm better than them. How is that? <laughs> there must be a reality to our confession. And that must be seen in our actions, in our deeds, that we help the deplorables, the, the undesirables, that we get nothing in return. There is reality. Let us be a real people. The, I was going to call him a prophet there, but we have to be careful. No, the evangelist Leonard Ravenhill. If you know who that is, look him up. Interesting character. Don't agree with everything that he said, but I agree with the spirit of the man. Tremendous evangelist. And he used to, to proclaim this statement. He said, you know, the world today needs to see a new demonstration of church in the world today far too much and these are my words now far too often the church is lost in the world because we behave like the world we carry on like the world you know again if you go to the states churches put advertisements in the newspapers like full-size giant the billboards they have advertisements on the tv on the radio it sounds like you're going to a holiday spa rather than coming to a, a, a church service great place for the kids you know water slides and movie screens and 
And Christ is lost in the Disneyland presentation. We are the church of Jesus Christ. If, you believe, if you're a believer here today and you say you have the spirit of Christ, then the nature and the practice of Christ should be demonstrated in your behavior, in your nature, that you are actively seeking to put others before yourself. You're actively seeking to honor others. Now, it's going to be hard. I'm not going to lie to you. It's going to be hard. Because it's against your nature. Jesus is not saying do something that's easy here. People will laugh and snigger and point fingers and think, oh dear, my goodness, what's he doing? The people in this world will not applaud you. Oh, that's so good. You're so humble. They're not going to say, oh, I appreciate the spirit of Christ within you. No, because the world is a dog eat dog world, isn't it? It is the fittest survive. But you see, Jesus says this right at the end. For you, shall, for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. And right there and then, we must always remember that this life comes to an end. That you have a fixed number of days. We live in this kind of bubble, don't we? Where I'm, what age am I now? What age am I, Don? Am I 44 or 45? I don't remember. I'm about 44 or 45. I don't remember. My wife's not here, so I can't ask her. Um, I think the boys are saying I'm 45. Yes, I'm 45. There we go. I'm not old. 45. And next year I'll be 46. Look, I can count. I don't, we go up in numbers, don't we? But in reality, the numbers should be going down. Not because I'm getting younger. Pfft, I wish. But because the, my days on earth are running out. We have a, an idea of time as a clock that goes round and round and round and round. and never comes to an end. But in reality, beloved, time is like the egg counter. And the sands of time are running out for each and every one of us. Our days on earth, the number of our days on earth are fixed. And they are getting fewer. Every second gone past is a second you never get back. One day you will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, the judge of all creation. He, shall, he who shall judge the living and the dead on that day. And each man must give an account for himself or herself. It is on that day when you are judged that your humility, your Christ-like spirit, it shall be lauded and applauded on that day. Do you remember Jesus tells the story of, of the, um, the, sheeps and the, the sheep and the goats? The sheep and the goats, excuse me. And it, he says to the goats, you know, when I was hungry, or he says to the sheep, when I was hungry, you, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When, you know, and, this, and then the sheep said, well, when, Lord? When did we do this? When? And Jesus said, when you did this for the, the least of all, these ones, you did it unto me. It is the nature of the sheep, the children of God, to say, Lord, I didn't do very much. You know, I wasn't that impressive. I just did what needed to be done. Christ remembers and records and writes down everything. There's nothing that will be missed. There's nothing that will be overlooked. Everything shall be brought out into the light. You will not be able to fake it. You'll not be able to be one of those who come and say, Lord, Lord, hey, hey. I was there and the Lord said, depart from me, you, wick, you workers of iniquity. I did not know you. Beloved, we do what we do not for the praise of man, or for personal benefit, not for the inflation of self. We do it for the praise of God. We do it unto his glory and his honor. We do it because he has demanded it of his church and his spirit lives within us, helping us to help those around us, to love everyone, especially the brethren, those brothers and sisters in the faith. 
Examine yourselves, beloved. Examine yourselves. Look at your conduct. Have you, are you like one of these Pharisees who jostle and struggle and fight to find position, fame, that your voice should be heard above all others? That you need to be like some sort of teenage girl who needs everyone to look at them, you know? Examine yourself. And if you find this sin, because beloved, it is a sin, in your heart, repent of it. Turn away from it. Ask Christ to help you. Put it behind you and fight against it when it tries to raise its ugly head again and again and tempt you back down that road, say, no, for the word has said, sin shall no longer be my master. If I fall, I shall arise, I shall go on. By the blood of the lamb, by the word of our testimonies, we overcome Satan. Beloved, let's pray for one another. Let's not sit here and think, well, hope she's listening to that. Hope he's listening to that. He needs to, if that's the attitude of your heart, beloved, you need to hear this. Let's not just simply be those who say, Lord, forgive me, and then tomorrow we're back to the same stuff again. Let's not say, Lord, forgive me, and then we host lunches or dinners for our friends and relatives and lackeys, but let us be those who seek to genuinely pour out our lives for the benefit of those who cannot help us, will not help us. Let us be like Jesus Christ who came to seek and to save the lost before they even asked. Jesus didn't, you didn't ask Jesus to come and save you. He came 2,000 years ago, lived a life and died a death to save you. You and I, we, we need to repeat that pattern. We pour out our lives for one another and for the people of this world that they might see a glorious and wonderful Savior, that they might know the reality, the reality of what it means to be church, that they might encounter the power of God and that they might be transformed and changed and added to our number. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are very conscious of how relevant this word is to all of us. That de- there is a thing inside us all, Lord, that desires likes, desires popularity, desires to be seen and to be heard. Lord, it is very far from our human nature to go to the last part, to the last seat, Lord, to to take the humble seat. We all desire, Lord, to be acknowledged. We all desire to be patted on the back and told how good and well we are. Lord, in this we have sinned many times. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you died for us and that you've forgiven our sins and that you've given us your spirit. And now, Lord, we are born again and are filled with the Holy Spirit and are, are, are enabled to live differently in this world. Help us, Lord, to live differently in this world. Help us, God, to live for one another, to be clothed in true humility, to be a server of men and not a self-server, to be a slave unto God, and a slave unto our fellow man and not to slavishly want others to applaud us or to serve us. Heavenly Father, we pray, come and have your way within our hearts, Lord. We recognize that this is a sin and that it's a sin that can condemn us to an eternity without you, Lord, to hell forever. Please, Lord, for those who do not know you, we ask, Lord, that you would demonstrate to them the reality of the dangers of living without Christ, the danger of living for self, the danger, Lord, that comes from 
rejecting you and your plan. Oh God, I pray, open the hearts of men and shine illumination upon their conscience. Oh God, and draw them to yourself. Summon them, call them, that they might know you. Lord, help them that they might believe and repent, that they might follow you and that they may be yours. Oh God, we do pray these things for your glory and your glory alone. In Jesus' precious name, amen. 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 Beloved, uh,